and welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to talk about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or ETI. We'll be talking about the SETI Institute, which has been searching for ETI since the mid-1980s. They do this by scanning the heavens with radio telescopes, looking for signals that seem to come from an intelligent source. With me in the studio is Seth Shostak, senior astronomer at the in SETI Institute. Seth has a PhD in astronomy from Caltech. He's written hundreds of articles on popular science topics. He co-authored a college textbook on astrobiology. He's a frequent lecturer on scientific issues. He won the 2004 Klumpke Roberts Award from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific for his contributions to the public understanding of astronomy and he's the host of the SETI Institute's radio show, Big Picture Science, which is heard on over 30 radio stations as well as on the internet. Seth, exactly how do you look for extraterrestrial intelligence? What do you really do? Well, you have to ask yourself, if there are intelligent beings on another world, around another star, how might they make themselves known? Now, one thing you could consider doing is just go visit them or wait for them to visit us. That doesn't turn out to be very practical. But there are other things that might be practical, like, as you mentioned, trying to eavesdrop on radio broadcasts that are coming our way, much as was done in the movie Contact. And that's the kind of thing we do. There are other things you could do. You could look for big engineering projects in space. That's another way to approach the problem. But the main thing is listening on these radio telescopes, right? That's what we do mostly. There are other experiments being run where they look for flashing lights in the sky. You know, maybe the aliens are wielding big lasers and occasionally aiming one in our direction. You know, you'd see a, a flash in the sky if you had a sensitive, sensitive enough telescope and a receiving setup. So that's a per perfectly legitimate approach. We actually have a video that shows some of your radio telescopes. We're going to show that. In fact, why don't we go ahead and run that video right now. There's no soundtrack on it, so we can just talk over it and we right. can discuss what we're looking at. Okay, so there are some telescopes. Where yeah. is this located, by the way? Well, this is right now, this is what's called the Allen Telescope Array because the money to build it was contributed by Paul Allen, co founder right. of Microsoft. Yeah. Right. And uh, this is located in Hat Creek, California. Uh, most viewers won't know where that is, but it's up in the Cascade Mountains. If you go up to Redding, for example, uh, up the Central Valley to Redding, then you make a right turn and go for an hour and a half into the Cascades, into the mountains there, you'll find Hat Creek. We located it there not because the scenery is beautiful, albeit it is, and not because of the cuisine, which is adequate, but uh, simply because it's very radio quiet there. The mountains shield these antennas from all the interference coming from the Bay Area. Now, why do you need multiple antennas? Are they all looking at a different place in the sky? You can do that. You can aim them each in their own direction if for some reason you want to you know, cover a big chunk of this sky. In general, however, we are using them as a team. They're all aimed in the same direction, and uh, they, you know, they just collect as much cosmic static, if you will, as they can. By having lots of them, you have more sensitivity. So, so there's bucket. a person, so you can see the scale of the telescope right. compared to a person. You could put one of these in your backyard here in Palo Alto, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, you might incur the wrath of your neighbors for this unsightly structure, but it isn't all that huge. It's a, the, the big dish is about 20 feet in diameter. So that looks like a technician making a slight adjustment there. Yes, indeed. That's, that's uh, the point of focus for the antenna. That's actually where the cosmic static comes in. That's where the rubber meets the road, if you will. And, of course, inside a small house, there are you know, banks of computers, a lot of electronics. Uh, it's a typical experiment in modern science. So how do you know what frequency to look for? Because the electromagnetic spectrum has a virtually infinite number of frequencies. There's a lot of stuff to look for. Where do you aim? Yeah, well, that's a good question. And indeed, the, the aliens have not been good enough to tell us where on the dial to tune. So you have to sort of second guess them. Now, a few things get ruled out right away at very low frequencies. When I say low frequencies, I mean like the frequencies of television broadcasts. For us, that's a low frequency are probably not so good because, it's, to begin with, there's a lot of interference on Earth. And uh, the, those low frequencies actually don't go through the, the gas and dust of space terribly well. Very high frequencies have other problems. But it turns out that it's sort of the middle of the radio dial, what's called the microwave spectrum. Microwave, the, you know, the same wavelengths you use to cook leftovers in your kitchen. Those frequencies actually go right through space like a knife through butter. And they also come right through the atmosphere of the Earth. So we tend to look at those frequencies. Now, what are you actually looking for? How would you differentiate an intelligent signal from a routine, non-intelligent one? Yeah, well, that's a good question because, of course, 
Uh, space makes a lot of radio noise. Right? There are entire cadres of astronomers who spend their day jobs, or their entire time actually, you know, looking, studying the natural cosmic sta uh, static from the, from the universe. Quasars and pulsars. Jupiter makes a lot of radio noise. The sun makes a lot of radio noise. How do you separate that out? Well, the trick is this. If you find a signal that's only really at one spot on the dial, that's not nature. Nature can't engineer that. That's the mark of a transmitter. So that's what we look for. We're, we're not looking for... You the know, signal the, stays at one place. It is, it's at one spot on the dial, and it stays there. Right? That tells you it's a transmitter. It doesn't tell you what they're saying. That's a different question. But it does tell you, well, we don't know what it is, Bob, but it's an artificially built transmitter. Have you ever found any signals or anything that might be a potential candidate to be what We find signals for? all the time, Marty. If, if you're sitting there at the telescope watching the screens, you will see a signal. Every 10 seconds will be a new signal. But I'm the kind of signals that you're looking for. Well, they are the kinds of signals you're looking for because they are these narrowband signals at one spot on the dial. However, we follow up on them immediately, within a few minutes. Okay, and then it turns out they all go away because what those signals turn out to be are, you know, radio s uh, signals coming from maybe the radar sets at the local airport or a very large source of, of interference, because that's what we consider it, is, uh, are the telecommunication satellites that are orbiting the Earth, right? You, you want, you know, to be able to make a phone call to Europe. Well, there are satellites that are relaying those signals, and those satellites produce a lot of signal in our antennas. Now, are you aiming at any specific point in the sky? Are there some areas that seem more promising than others, more likely to find habitable planets? Well, we think so. I mean, of course, we don't know. We don't know where the aliens are hanging out. But we make rather conservative assumptions in general. To begin with, you search around stars that might have planets. Now, we don't know that many stars that have planets. We know, as of today, on the order of maybe 500, 600. A lot more are being discovered as we sit here and will be announced over the course of the next couple of years. But even so, the number is going to be thousands, a few thousand. That's right. Now, I understand that the Kepler mission has vastly increased the number of planets that are considered candidates for habitation. Well, there are planets in the so-called habitable zone of the stars. That is to say, they're at the right distance from their star so that they're not too hot, not too cold, and maybe you could have liquid oceans and that sort of thing. Obviously, those are very high-quality candidates. You would look in those directions. But, you know, the bottom line is this. If you're going to find ET, you can't just look at a few hundred or a few thousand star systems, even if you know they have planets. That's not good enough. You could have turned an antenna on Earth, right, for four and a half billion years and not picked up a single radio signal from it because, as it turns out, the dinosaurs did not build radio transmitters. So you really have to look at a very long list. And uh, so we try and do that. We try and look at as many star systems as we can. I'm interested in the Kepler mission because I've heard that it's identified a lot of planets that might be candidates. Also, we have some slides from the Kepler mission, which I'm anxious to show our audience. So let's go ahead and take a look at those slides. Can we see the first slide about the Kepler mission? Okay, so there it is. So they're putting the Kepler satellite together, and those are picture elements, I think something similar to what you might have in a regular video camera. Right, so those are the CCDs. More. It's a whole array of CCDs. Exactly the sort of uh, chip you might have in the back of your, uh, your digital camera. Uh, these are very high quality ones and very big ones. But what happens is those form a camera because there's a big mirror in the telescope and it's focused on those chips. It's a big camera that's aimed at a part of the sky. It's in the constellation of Cygnus, largely. And it just stares at 150,000 stars the ultimate staring contest. And thanks to those chips, it can measure the brightness of each of those stars every 30 seconds. Now we have another, a second slide. Let's see the second slide. OK, so that is the Kepler satellite itself. And I believe it's in orbit around the sun, not the Earth. Yeah, it's, it's trailing the Earth. Well, the idea is to get the Earth out of the sky of this thing so it, you know, it doesn't block the view of Kepler. So it, it follows the Earth around the sun a little bit. But indeed, that's it. It's just a telescope in space, like so many other telescopes in space. But as I say, this one has a very specific mission. Its job is to measure the brightness of 150,000 stars for years, just staring at them. Some of them, if they have planets, those planets will get in front of the star occasionally. Just the way if you looked at the sun from the right directions, you would see the Earth get in front of the sun every 365 days, right? And you would see a slight diminution in the light coming from the sun. So that's, and that's how they tell the planet is there when exactly. the, the sun dims. And I think we have one more slide. Uh, there. So that's a picture of the Milky Way galaxy. And that yellow area is the area 
that Kepler is searching in. Mm -hmm. So since we're located on one of the spiral arms of the galaxy, it's looking toward the base of the spiral arm because I think that's where there's a greater density of stars. Yeah, well, it's, it's been chosen to be sort of a representative area of the galaxy with a high number of stars in the field of view, indeed.